This is Safari in its heyday. Dangerous and bloody. Yet romantic and luxurious. The history of Safari in Africa is a story that is far from simple. It's entangled with the controversial story of white settlers, colonial life, and the spread of the British Empire. As a white man born in Swaziland, I've been on a journey through Safari to try to understand its complicated past and contentious present. I've visited the most incredible landscapes and experienced the thrills and seduction of wild animals firsthand. Jumbo Jumbo Kenya. Spectacular. Look, there's a leopard. There's a leopard. I've discovered that the story of Safari is teeming with extraordinary characters, wayward lifestyles, and huge sex appeal. So beds and hunting and safari were all shared in a very fluid, Absolutely. open way. Yeah, and no jealousy. And I've tried to understand why the excitement of hunting still draws passionate supporters. There he is. My journey has shown me that ultimately, safari is about exhilaration and freedom. It's been the adventure of a lifetime. In 1896, the British East African government started building a railway line from Mombasa on the Indian Ocean coast through Kenya to Uganda. As the empire expanded, a trade route to the heart of Africa was deemed vital. Nicknamed the Lunatic Express, the line opened in 1903 and was soon transporting wealthy British adventurers in search of safari and big game hunting. Nairobi became the main station. It's here I begin my own safari. Nairobi began in 1899. It was a simple railway depot on the Lunatic Railway Express. Back then, zebra, lion, wildebeest, giraffes roamed the dust track that passed the main street. What initially began as a few huts and very basic, basic infrastructure then developed into a city uh, that was never planned. By 1907, it was declared the official capital of British East Africa. Nairobi has grown into a noisy, chaotic city of over two million people. But just minutes from the busy city centre is a peaceful glimmer of a British colonial past. This is the legendary Norfolk Hotel. I've come to Kenya to find out about the history of safari and how it's entwined with the controversy of a colonial past and the Norfolk is the perfect place to start. Welcome to Fiam the Norfolk. I'm Richard Kimin, the general manager. Thank you very much. I'm Richard too. This mock Tudor edifice opened for business on Christmas Day in 1904 and was the place for wealthy Brits to begin their safari. The Norfolk offered elegance and luxury in the wilds of Africa. It represents how the British were keen to transfer their entire lifestyle into the African bush. The exotic opulence was a huge draw to the British colonists, some of whom became notorious for their errant ways. So this was the epicenter of, of the hotel. colonial life. Colonial life, because here we used to have cottages where they used to come and pay billiards and uh, wife swapping and all that, according to the history. <laughs> And that doesn't happen now? No, it doesn't There's happen. There's no wife-swapping now in Nairobi? Not anymore. Welcome, this is your suite. 
Thank you very much. Oh, wow. Well, welcome, and here. Oh, hi, luxury. Thank you, Richard. Your bedroom is over here. An oasis in the middle of Nairobi. Thank you very much. I wish you a very good stay with us, overlooking the hotel, oh, main fun. courtyard. The grandeur and pomp of the Norfolk is timelessly British and reminds me of my own history. What I'm always struck by is how extraordinary the contrast is between coming in on that train from Mombasa, crowded with people and the chaos of uh, Nairobi traffic where people don't stop for the red traffic lights or uh, pedestrian crossings. This is a sort of higgledy-piggledy, uh, organized chaos. And then you come through the Norfolk Hotel, a bastion of colonialism. And I suppose my upbringing in Swaziland, in the last gasp of empire, I suppose to my shame that I grew up in a household where we had servants, uh, a cook, a housekeeper, two gardeners. I couldn't even boil an egg when I went to university, burnt toast. Uh, so <laughs> to come back here as a white boy coming back to Africa, the history of safari, it's a, it's a sort of complete circle journey to go through. And I don't know how much you can, you know, cat and nine tails and lash yourself for colonial guilt. Growing up in Swaziland meant living in a society that was British in the extreme. And my father was head of education for the colonial administration. Throughout my childhood, we regularly went on photo safaris, as well as hunting trips with my father for venison, though I never shot an animal myself. The idea of hunting for pleasure never appealed, but what I want to know is why it was so important to the early settlers and what involvement the indigenous African people had. To find out, I need to go back to the very beginnings of safari. Safari derives from the Swahili word meaning journey and was originally used to describe the trade routes used by coastal Arabs and Swahilis who transported ivory, rhino horn and slaves from the African interior to the Asian market. The trade routes were extremely lucrative and attracted the attentions of powerful European countries eager to get their hands on them. This resulted in what became known as the Scramble for Africa and in 1885, at the Berlin Conference, European leaders met to divide up Africa into independent spheres of influence under European rule. Britain bagged Uganda and Kenya, which all came under British protectorate rule and were christened British East Africa. The newly acquired lands were vast with an abundance of wildlife that the British government had big plans for. They began advertising back home for the British aristocracy to begin a pioneering new way of life and money-making enterprise. In the early 1900s, British East Africa proved an irresistible draw to the aristocracy back home. They could come out here and buy hundreds of acres of land cheaply, build homes at little cost, employ local people to work for them, whilst enjoying an idyllic year-round temperate climate. One of the first and most controversial British settlers to take up the challenge was Hugh Chumley, the third Baron Delamere. Lord Delamere acquired 100,000 acres of land close to the equator in 1901. He arrived by train and disembarked at this level crossing and declared that the open plains stretching around him would be where he would build his first home and business venture, Equator Ranch. So I'd arranged to meet Professor David Anderson of Oxford University to find out how Lord Delamere became one of the leading lights of early settler life. David, was this the original house? No, this house is a more modern construction, but this is where the farm was. This is, you're right in the centre of it here. How brave or bold or foolhardy, in your opinion, was it to come here and <coughs> take over a thousand acres of... Well, unoccupied land. You know, that's a great question because you, you look at it now and you think, well, how in heaven's name did they do this? He arrived here with almost nothing and he lived like a pauper for a couple of years. So this is not a rich British aristocrat coming 
to play around in Africa. Mm -hmm. This is someone who's down on his luck, having hard times, coming to make a fresh start. And by God, did he work at it. So how did he plan to make money? What did he try to farm? Well, he brought out, initially he tried sheep on the farm. I mean, that was quite a shrewd notion. This was not a bad area for sheep. But he tried to bring in exotic stock from New Zealand. Um, they did okay at first, then they all died because they contracted fevers and other diseases. Then he brought in Herefordshire bulls from the UK, had them imported at huge expense. He sent his stockmen off to New Zealand to buy some other stock. He thought some merino sheep would be even better. He brought those in. Vast expense, shipping stock halfway around the world to come here in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it's, it's an astonishing adventure. You might say misadventure, because none of it worked. But as well as being an entrepreneur, Lord Delamere was also an enthusiastic hunter. He had grown up in the British aristocratic tradition and had also spent many years hunting elephant for ivory across the African continent before settling in British East Africa. But when it came to clearing his newly acquired farmland of wildlife, Lord Delamere seemed to take the sport of hunting into questionable territory. So how notorious was he? He was very ambitious and very energetic. And in fact, he, it's quite an interesting story. He got involved in a spat with a guy called Sir Harry Johnston, who was the governor of Uganda. And he wrote a very nasty letter to the Royal Geographical Society, accusing Delamere of hunting with a Gatling gun, which is an, an early machine gun, mm -hmm. mounted on a ridge top up in North Beringo, and sort of creaming out the elephants. Now, Delamere always denied this and said he hadn't done it. But Johnson really made a fuss about it, and, and, and some of the mud certainly stuck to Delamere's reputation early on. Was it true? It could well have been, because there were a lot of hunters in those early days who were quite exploitative, mostly looking for adventure, looking for a quick buck. They were a dangerous crew, because they were keen to do well, and they were prepared to exploit in order to do well. And by God, in Kenya, they did that. Lord Delamere undoubtedly set the tone for settler behaviour by refusing to allow wildlife to get in the way of British enterprise. To make the African land suitable for farming, the mass slaughter of big game animals began. This was made an enjoyable and sportsmanlike experience by introducing the custom of the hunt, with some early settlers even importing packs of hunting hounds from England and riding out on the African plains kitted out in traditional pinks or scarlet jackets. A contemporary of Delamere's in the early days was fellow hunter and sportsman Lord Cranworth. Cranworth was pivotal in encouraging more aristocrats to join the settlement drive. He believed that the hunting sportsman had a vital role in making British East Africa a success and wrote an extensive essay entitled A Colony in the Making or Sport and Profit in British East Africa. In his essay, Lord Cranworth did all he could to encourage fellow aristocrats to head out to British East Africa. He wrote, British East Africa forms in some respects the most peculiar of His Majesty's dominions in that within so comparatively small an area it embraces so much variety and possibilities for British enterprise. He then went on to offer tips for new arrivals. Do yourself well on the food line. Take plenty of wine after sunfall, more especially Burgundy and Port. They enrich the blood and are agreeable to the palate. Bear in mind and act on the old maxim, keep the spirits up, the bowels open, and wear flannels next to the skin. Later on in the essay, Lord Cranworth's wife, Lady Cranworth, offered her hints for a woman in British East Africa. Having arrived up country, about the first operation will be to collect one's staff of servants. When one becomes accustomed to the sight of black faces, Native servants will be found very fairly good. They're quite intelligent and soon assimilate any knowledge that one is in a position to impart. Lord Cranworth concluded with a rousing appeal to British big game hunters. The present is the day of the sportsman, the man of riches of the white hunter. Gung-ho and spirited the early pioneering settlers may have been, but they also felt completely assured of their natural right to rule and to exhaustively exploit every resource and the native peoples of British East Africa. 
In 1907, Ewart Grogan, a well-known figure in the early settler years, publicly flogged three of his staff on the steps of the Nairobi courthouse for frightening his niece by driving his rickshaw too erratically. Lord Cranworth wrote that he knowingly exploited the Maasai and Kikuyu tribes by trading cheap trinkets and opera glasses in exchange for valuable ivory. This is the image of colonialism that makes me feel uncomfortable about my own past. But to try and get a better understanding of the early settlers, who were generations before my time, I want to meet their descendants, whom I hope can tell me more. First up is Tony Seth Smith at his home on the shores of Lake Naivasha. But Tony, correct me if I'm wrong, your pa arrived here 106 years ago, which would make it... 1904. And his brother, his elder brother Martin, had come out the year before. And why did he come here in the first place? I hope for adventure. And it was, I suppose, one of the last frontiers. You know, Canada had been opened up and the west of the United States and Australia and so on. And so they were in on virgin ground as they saw it then. Do you feel that they had a sense of entitlement in the spread of empire and that it wasn't questioned in any way? I think to a degree, in as much as the country was largely untamed, undeveloped, uh, and they were bringing development and civilization as they saw it. And so they had a moral edge on the people who were already here. But I don't think they felt that they were taking it away from them. I was born and brought up in Swaziland, and my father always said to me that even though you are born here, you are a, essentially, as a white person, you're a guest in this country. So I always had that, I, I suppose, a wobble in my mind about whether owning land or not, whether I had a right to do that. Has this ever crossed your mind at all? No. Kenya was a colony, and Swaziland was never a colony. No, it was a protected. Uh, we came and colonized this country, we the British, and plus a few Scandinavians and things. And we were issued land, we paid for that land, they didn't take it. Mm -hmm. But I think people like my father also had a degree of I wonder if this is fair to the African. I often heard him say, well, the poor African, he's getting the thin end of the wedge on this or that. Uh, but of course, as I say, you've got to remember that there were only one and a half million of them at that time. Mm -hmm. And now they're 40 million. So people who want to be critical see the country as it is today and say, how could you come and take land away when it's so congested and everyone's looking for a patch of land? Well, it wasn't like that then. Um, you've got to take things as they were at the time. For Tony's father's generation of early 20th century settlers, the extraordinary and abundant wildlife was little more than a pest that stood in their way. Getting rid of them would give Tony his first exhilarating experience of hunting. It was like having weeds in your field or whatever. It stymied your endeavours, whether you were growing wheat or trying to grow cattle and the lambs would eat the cattle and the leopards would kill the sheep and zebra and reedbuck and so on would be in the crop and flattening it. And so game was considered vermin in those days. And so on the whole, on the white settler's land, game was decimated. It was a way of life, you know, one was brought up with a rifle in your hand and protecting your crops. Do you remember when you first shot a big animal? Yes, the first big thing was a buffalo in our wheat and, and I was really quite nervous about it. And I was only about 13 or 14, I suppose. And one's heart, little heart was pumping away with excitement as I got near this terrifying beast. And uh, anyway, to my delight and surprise, I got it. What, what was the feeling after you just shot it? A mixture of fear and exhilaration, I suppose. It's, that's the whole point in hunting. You, you've got to be, of the wildlife, the, of the dangerous wildlife, you've got to have a certain amount of respect, even if it's not actually fear. You've got to have a lot of respect for it. 
one gets a lot of criticism for having done a lot of hunting and being a hunter and, and being passionate about hunting. But uh, you had to have done it to understand it. Hunting big game became a central part of the lifestyle of the early white settlers. It was a sport they loved. But out here on the African plains, they could take it onto a much bigger and more exciting scale. Fox and grouse were chicken feed compared to this. Hunting in British East Africa was a man's game. Rituals were established that glorified the triumphant hunter. He would be photographed with his trophy kill. Heads and skins were removed and preserved for him to take home and adorn his walls. If I'm going to try and understand the appeal and thrill of hunting, I need to get first-hand experience. I'm heading north out of Nairobi towards Lake Naivasha in the heart of the Great Rift Valley. And it's my first chance to see the magnificent wildlife. This is absolutely incredible. God, look at this, all on the run. I'm on my way to meet Gordy Church, who is a modern-day professional hunter. Gordy, I'm Richard. Lovely to meet you. How are you? Welcome and you? Oh, Hunting has been banned in Kenya since 1977, so Gordy spends most of his time working in neighbouring Tanzania, where he takes paying clients on hunting safaris tailored to what they want to shoot. I meet him on his father's 80,000 acre estate, which operates horseback safaris. Gordy, assume that I know absolutely nothing about what your job is. What is it that you actually do as a professional hunter? I guess, you know, from the outset, when you are selling that hunt, it's being able to make sure that you select the right trophy, making the approach that's all the tracking and getting the wind right and um, making sure that your guest is comfortably in, in the best position and to guide him through the whole process up to the point that he squeezes the trigger. So for people who've never hunted or find the idea of shooting an animal as a trophy um, a bizarre concept. What, what's the, the kick of doing it? I think as a client who's never hunted before, um, it's the thrill of, of being um, out in the wilderness, not you know, in a car, in the safety of a car, but you're really out on foot, um, you know, experiencing everything that Africa has to offer in terms of its you know, wildlife areas. And you know, there's a, a certain amount of adrenaline involved in the actual hunt and in the stalk. But it's sort of more than that, it's the sort of, you know, it's the adventure that comes with it. Gordy offers to take me riding to see some of his father's land and game. Being out in the vast wilderness, I begin to understand the enormous sense of freedom that the world of safari offers. To experience the thrill of the hunt, but without the kill, Gordy invites me to go tracking to see if we can get close enough to some game within shooting distance. When we're close enough, Gordy hands me the gun, which he reassures me is unloaded. Okay, bolts open. Okay. No ammo. So what you want to do is you want to pull that tight into 
your cheek. Okay. Grip that nicely, right? Lean slightly forward into the shot. Keep those legs spread. And then what you want to do is put that bead and sit right in the bottom of that V. Okay. Holding the rifle and looking down the sights sets your pulse racing. The sense of power is thrilling and electric. I still don't think I could do it. Maybe, I don't know. Have you ever had people that have lost their nerve? Yeah. Yeah, I've had, um, I mean, there's a common thing called black fever when someone gets so excited. They? they start to shake. But it's just a question of getting them to calm down and, and thinking about it. And you know, the thing is, you don't have to take the shot. That's not the point. The point is, is exploring this beautiful area and coming to this point. We have many clowns who get to that point and they'll think, yeah, it's too beautiful, I'm not going to take the shot. You never have to take the shot. Just even doing that, there's no question that you have a, it's like sort of being the secret seven of the famous five. There's an adrenaline rush that you feel that I don't know, maybe your DNA of hunting from God knows when kicks in, but it's, if I could shoot and know that I wasn't killing the animal, could hold it up and then I trot it off an hour later, I'd do it like a shot. It's very exciting. Stalking and tracking with Gordy has catapulted me back to my childhood. I was just hit by an incredible nostalgia because the last time I did this, I was hunting with my father when I was a boy in Swaziland and uh, when he shoot, he would shoot Impala. Um, there was always this overwhelming regret that I felt that you'd be sitting on the back of a pickup truck with the dead animal that was still warm um, and wishing it that it could come back to life. Even without bullets, there's no doubt tracking and hunting game has a buzz that's unique and difficult to understand unless you try it. Gordy had converted me into a hunter, albeit of the non-killing variety. By the early 1900s, the settlers had realized they were onto a good thing and that perhaps they could sell the experience and adventure of big game hunting worldwide to paying clients. A whole infrastructure for commercial hunting began to take shape in British East Africa as wealthy tourists started to flock there. To cater for the growing demand, special safari outfitting companies began to spring up in the rapidly growing town of Nairobi. I headed to the National Archives where catalogues of old newspapers are kept from the early settler days. I wanted to look for adverts from the original outfitting firms and met up with Professor Anderson again who agreed to help me. This is the East African Standard, one of the first newspapers in the colony. And here we have on the standard for uh, 1906, typical adverts that relate to the safari trade, hunting and all the things that go with it. And these are companies that outfit safaris. So I could go and get you could go and you, you could buy a safari chair and a tent and camping equipment from Smith Mackenzie and Co. Excellent. Um, and there's another one that describing themselves as colonial stores, Mombasa and Nairobi, selling wholesale and retail, all kinds of things. Including yeah, yeah. Callum's perfection whiskey, Ferguson paints and oils, wines and spirits, green rock proof tents. Yep. They're all huge it's grand tents from 1903 with verandas with porches. These are statements of status, class, importance. And my goodness, no African sets foot in those tents. So the, the, the embedded in the safari story, in its very material culture, is a history of separation and difference Entitlement, and distance. Entitlement, luxury. Yeah. So all of this, I mean, it'd be the equivalent of you know, the, the Times of London having a huge advert for Harrods saying, come, come here, on the first day. We'll fix you. But it's pretty sophisticated you, for 1906 and a 10. You can fit everything out from the one, it's a one-stop shop. So yeah. this was enormous business. Huge business. Even then. And, and, and these companies would, would put you in touch with labor recruiters who would also arrange for your porters and transportation 
food supplies, everything you needed. So they'd sell your equipment, but they'd also fix your trip for you. As these companies grew, there would be one major client who would take the idea of big game hunting combined with extraordinary luxury and transform it into a pursuit renowned the world over. The recently retired President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt. The President arrived in East Africa at the end of his second term in office and he trailblazed into town, accompanied by his 19-year-old son Kermit and a vast entourage. Roosevelt chose the hunting outfitters Newland and Tarleton to kit out his safari. The company also provided him with the first generation of newly founded professional hunting guides, R.J. Cunningham and Philip Percival. These men were experienced hunters who would lead the elder statesman through the dangerous bush in search of his trophies. The former president's arrival was a huge coup for the burgeoning British expat community, and they were keen to play host to him while he hunted. Roosevelt began his safari on land owned by Lord and Lady Pease, who were still building their home when the party arrived. In the pastures close to the Pease's family home on the Kapiti Plains, I met Don Young, the current owner of the Newland and Tartan safari farm. What are you recreating here today? We've taken a photograph from the Roosevelt Safari of Roosevelt's personal sleeping tent that oh. he had set up when he arrived. So we're going to put up the Roosevelt tent and kit it out the way Roosevelt had it done back in 1909. And on what scale was this safari undertaken? How many people did it involve? It was huge. When he arrived at the station, uh, the Kapiti station, there were 250 people waiting for him with 20 armed Askaris or soldiers to escort him. And they all shouted out, greetings to the King of America, greetings to the King of America. And they were all in their perfect Newland and Tarleton uh, uniforms and it was a small army actually. So out of those 250 people that were lined up at the station, what was the division of what they each did? Roosevelt himself had six assistants and they stayed with him throughout the trip until they got to the Sudan where they switched all the porters over and by then they were 500 porters. By modern US dollar standards this was a one million dollar safari. This is the biggest thing that ever happened to Kenya and it literally put Kenya in the consciousness of millions and millions of people that would otherwise think of Africa only as the dark continent. If you want to help the guys, let's both grab a, a, a line and we'll stretch these out and hammer in the stakes. Okay, I'll get a mallet. Despite being out in the African bush, Roosevelt refused to lower his living standards and set the style for luxury on safari. His tent was fitted out just like home. He even bought his own writing bureau and leather-bound book collection. So this was done every night, and how, how long did the safari go on for? It went on for a year. Roosevelt, of course, dined extremely well on safari, eating the fresh game meat that was killed daily and cooked on an open fire. How do you like your lamb, Richard? Charred. Charred. We can yeah. do charred. He encouraged his entourage to dress up for dinner and to enjoy fine wines and malt whiskies. Richard, we've set a table as if this was Teddy Roosevelt on safari, a, a dinner uh, meal. Uh -huh. So you've done a great job baking some bread and you've grilled some meat, which we're going to have in a minute. But I've also set things out, like Roosevelt wrote that he, the binoculars were actually invented during Roosevelt's lifetime. So these would have been quite new technology. And he went around and was actually given a pair. So this is the uh, Roosevelt oh, wow. era pair of binoculars. And really exciting, we have a lovely photograph of Roosevelt standing with the latest Eastman Kodak camera. And we actually managed to find in Nairobi the exact edition that Roosevelt was carrying with him on safari. And uh, this is just to give you an idea how... This is a Kodak. This is the Eastman Kodak. All the pictures of Roosevelt on safari were taken in cameras like this. You could actually adjust this for depth of field and frame your picture by moving the bellows back and forth. By which time you could be gored by a rhino. By which time you'd definitely be run over by a rhino.
Although it sounds contradictory, Teddy Roosevelt was both an avid hunter and devoted conservationist. He brought with him a vast team of scientists and justified his year-long hunt by proclaiming he was shooting as many animals as possible in the name of natural history and transporting his trophies back as specimens to adorn the museums of New York. Among his team of scientists was Carl Akeley, a hunter, inventor and sculptor who revolutionized taxidermy by creating giant dioramas, reconstructed scenes from the African bush with plants and real stuffed animals. Akeley and Roosevelt's scientific endeavors attracted worldwide interest and expectation. Don't forget, there was our big safari, the Newland Tarleton Safari of 250 porters. Following them, like a little shadow universe, parallel universe, were reporters from all over the world. There was an entire safari that followed him around, and every time he allowed them, they all came in and took his pictures. He had, he had his own private photographer called Heller, so most of the images we have were shot by him. But this is a media circus. Yeah, well, what's extraordinary is that how did they ever, if they were moving this great phalanx of an army through the bush, how did they not frighten every bit of game off? Well, there's your point. They had to put the, put the camp aside, and then they would ride out for an hour or two out into the game country. This is virtually what's called a naive wildlife population. They'd hardly seen other humans or hardly been hunted. So the, the game was so thick. And if you, if you read Roosevelt, the biggest problem with the hunt was Roosevelt himself. He was blind in one eye. Typical Roosevelt, he'd been boxing in the White House, okay? He'd been punched in the eye by one of his mates in hemorrhage, and he went blind. But he wouldn't let anyone know this. So how good a shot was he? Lousy, lousy shot. So it was a case of somebody, he took a big old blast and somebody else had to go and... Leslie Tarleton, as, as hunters do today, the professional hunters today stand right off the shoulder. So he's like an actor with a stuntman. Absolutely. While Teddy Roosevelt may have been a poor shot, during his year-long safari, he personally bagged 216 animals, and the sum total killed or trapped by his party totaled a staggering 11,788 animals, all in the name of science. By the time Roosevelt's epic safari was over, newspapers and newsreels around the world had championed his landmark achievements. When he returned to the US, Roosevelt wrote his seminal book, African Game Trails, which glorified his safari and set an impossible precedent, inspiring many other Americans to emulate his frontier adventures. Wannabe cowboys like Buffalo Jones turned up in British East Africa and attempted to tame the wild game using Wild West methods on the African plains. The frontier spirit was in the American blood and they loved it. Within a few years of its beginnings as a simple rail depot, Nairobi had been transformed into a westernized town, the hub of a burgeoning safari industry and home to an expanding community of British expats who were growing rich on its profits. Society developed a British way of life. The newly founded turf club held weekly race meetings and polo matches, and families entertained with luncheons, picnics and garden parties. Emerging from the First World War, the British government set about encouraging more gentry to emigrate to support the push for colonization. Their masterstroke of recruitment took place here at the then Theatre Royal in the heart of Nairobi, where they advertised plots of land up for grabs. The Protectorate was offering a new way of life that Safari encapsulated. Freedom, luxury, power, danger and excitement. A land free from the restrictions of life back home. So at the end of the First World War, 1918, the British East African government renewed their attempts to lure more wealthy Brits to come and settle permanently in Kenya. So in this piece of spectacular showmanship, 
They invited everyone to a national lottery draw. Parcels of land were handed out at knockdown prices. They anticipated you know, a few hundred people at best, but they were swamped by over 2,000. There was absolute mayhem in here. Chaotic, it's like a tombola. Roll up, roll up! 200 pounds with this piece over here! 100 pounds over there! Give me, what's the best part? No, what are you going to do with that? Five, six, seven, there. Leg line mesh, I don't have it here. And it was absolutely jammed right here in what was formerly the Theatre Royal, Nairobi, and which today, ironically, is divided up into a church service down below and the cameo cinema up here, which until very recently showed films of a uh, rather, shall we say, vibrant nature. It's an extraordinary thing that you could have the presumption that you could come from another country in the Northern Hemisphere and arrive here, open plains, open land, and think, well, there's nobody living on it that we can see. We're just going to take it for ourselves, and we'll have it, and we'll build a theatre here and call it the Theatre Royal Nairobi. Bonkers. The marketing campaign paid off. In 1920, British East Africa became a fully-fledged colony and was renamed Kenya. Safari was entering its boom years as hordes of wealthy tourists flocked to the freedom and thrills that Africa offered. To get a taste of the luxury that 1920s safari now offered, I headed southwest from Nairobi and into the Maasai Mara. The Mara is breathtaking. Acacia trees are scattered across the vast plains and big game animals roam freely. Driving through it is awe-inspiring. Jumbo Jumbo Kenya. What's so jaw dropping about this landscape is that the Kruger National Park in South Africa feels almost suburban in comparison in the sheer scale of what there is all around you here. That's the thing that I was completely unprepared for. I'm en route to find the Cotter's 1920 safari camp. American-born Charles Cotter was the first in the family line to head out to Kenya to settle in 1910. Cotter soon earned a reputation as a fearless hunter and brought danger and excitement to safari. He also tapped into the growing American market as safari became an elitist pastime for the super rich. Cotter Safari Service first opened for business in 1919, and the latest in the family to take over the helm is Calvin Cotter, Charles's great grandson. Thanks, James. Santi, Santi. Hi, Calvin. Good How are you? How are you? Welcome to camp. Oh, thank you. Hi. Jamwa. Hi, Atura. Hi, Atura. Hi, Jamwa. Cindy. Hi, Jamwa. So you're fourth generation? I am uh, fourth generation. Welcome to camp. Thank you. So this is an Edwardian drawing room? This is... Under canvas? Yeah. Effective. In the middle of the Mara? Yeah. And this created that elegance that you see in films and the whole mystique about safari. It comes from that period of time, especially in the 20s, where it was very much a luxury item to do. And they, they played on that. My, my, my family and people in that business made their camps as unique as possible. I'll show you um, some family heirlooms. Here's my grandfather's hat, his original hat, and a lot of original books from that era. This gun was used for shooting a, a, a very big buffalo in 50, I think 56. Is that why it's got this buffalo on here? Exactly. Does it still work? Oh, very much so. Oh, yeah. 
it looks to me like walking into Meryl Streep and Robert Redford out of Africa. Is that what people say when they arrive here? Yes, and that, that's what we want them to feel. And what, who were the hunting uh, and safari clients who were attracted to come here then? Um, it was mostly American commercial families or railroad families. They were the ones that had the big, you know, big money, money enough. Yeah, big money. Cotter Safari boomed in the 1920s and 30s. Charles had three sons, Bud, Mike and Ted, who were all big game hunters. But as with Roosevelt's original safari, the Cotter Safari wasn't just about killing. Together, the brothers pioneered the genre of natural history filmmaking at considerable risk of themselves by skillfully luring wild animals close up to the cameras. And it was Charles's thirst for danger that would prove fatal. In 1940, he was gored by a charging rhinoceros and died aged 67. His sons vowed to carry on the family's safari tradition. Do you feel the spirit of all these men oh. in you and here? Yeah, uh, right here because, okay, my great-grandfather was killed by a, a rhino five kilometers over there. My father was hit by a buffalo and very nearly killed three kilometers over there. And my formative years was all here. My, my first hunting experience was here. It's a magical place. And it's, I've come back to my roots, which is here. The gods are talking to us. They are. Full on rain. Pure organic water. Oh, it's beautiful. The Cotters were also innovators in the use of early motorized vehicles for safari. Charles ordered four American Ford chassis and parts to be shipped to Mombasa. The vehicles were assembled by his three sons, and within a year they'd replaced the traditional use of porters, ox carts and donkeys. To keep this tradition alive, Calvin has maintained a 20-style vehicle, and he took me out into the Mara to get a flavour of that bygone era. Let's see if we can cross this stream up here. What happens if we get stuck? Well, I've got you to push. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is it. This is it, Calvin. Buffalo. Oh, there's out there. Pardon me. There's herds of them. Yeah. yeah. They're all around us. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Calvin, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. Everywhere. Also. Let's do 600 of them here or more. It's awe-inspiring to be surrounded by these dangerous and unpredictable wild animals. Calvin's taking us in. Might be Custer's last stand. How aggressive are they? They can be quite aggressive. As long as they're on your side of the car, I'm not worried. That's what's so extraordinary. This is a big buffalo. See that buffalo there? Yeah. You know, if you're on your third last day of a buffalo hunt and you hadn't succeeded in getting a bigger one, it would be very, very huntable, this one. You know, the Holy Grail is 50 inches. Between the curves, one outer end of the horn to the other outer end of the curve, it's probably about 44, 45 inches. God, look at this, all on the run. Seeing such impressive big game close up was the perfect end to the day at Cotter's camp. And although we weren't hunting as they would have done back in the 1920s, 
I was beginning to get seduced by the heady luxury of it all. Good oh, Jumbo Francis. Jumbo, Jumbo. Santisana. Cheers. Yes. Oh. It's incredible to imagine that in the 1920s, people would have come on safari and trekked out into the middle of nowhere in the Masai Mara with all this luxury tenting and equipment and baths available. But I tell you, I can imagine that after a day of hunting and safari, this is the way to go. Chin chin. Oh, this is life. Colonial settlers became giddy with the freedom of their African lifestyle, safari being the natural extension of this. But the burgeoning colony would soon gain the reputation as a wayward society. Free from the strictures of British rules and regulations, a minority became uncontrollable. Boozy romps and sexual shenanigans were rife, and the infamous Muthega Club was the hub. So much so that no cameras have ever been allowed inside and filming is not permitted in the grounds to this day. Colonial stalwarts declared that a small minority were tarnishing the colony's reputation, but the clique, nicknamed the Happy Valley Set, carried on regardless. And this free and easy loosening of morals became an integral part of safari. The macho sport had undoubted sex appeal which lured women and a new breed of seducer hunters emerged, promising romance in the wilds of Africa. One of the most famous was Baron Braw von Blixen. Blixen was a Swedish aristocrat brought up in the hunting tradition and was portrayed in the Hollywood epic Out of Africa in 1985 as the adulterous husband of Karen Blixen. Throughout the 20s and 30s, Braw had a string of wealthy clients queuing up to pay for his services, and his reputation as a prolific lover became legend. But what was it that Braw had that made him so adored? I met his godson, Ulf Askarn, to find out. Ulf, can you show me a photograph of Braw? I can indeed. This is not typical of Braw at all, because very seldom did you see him dressed up in a suit and a tie. But this is a, a more typical picture. And he wasn't one of these guys who had bullet belts and no binoculars. No posturing. Nothing. He just carried a gun and a few bullets in his pocket. That was it. So considering that he wasn't conventionally handsome, he was a legendary ladies' man. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> And one of the secrets was that if he met a lady, his concentration was so total that that woman or girl thought that she was the only woman on earth. He never wavered. I mean, he, he never took his eyes off the particular person he was speaking to. He just looked them in the eye and he talked to them and he listened. He was a very good listener. That was his secret. For the women lucky enough to be on a broad Blixen safari, nothing was too much trouble. He would cater to their every whim. If we go back to this particular safari, which they had two aircrafts on standby, because once a week the matriarch demanded to be flown to Nairobi once a week to have her hair done. <laughs> <laughs> and on for the hunt. <laughs> and that. not only that, the plane then came back fully laden with Evian water for her bathtub. Bell Markham said that when he died, he broke the mold. Yes, I think she was right. And they were lovers as well, were they? I think definitely, yes. In a friendly way. Yes. <laughs> So beds and hunting and safari were all shared in a very fluid, Absolutely. open way. Yeah, and, and no jealousy, which was the best of all. Are you like that? Uh, I probably was. <laughs> no, no more. <laughs> no. 
Braw Blixen became the highest paid professional hunter of his generation. He formed a professional partnership with fellow hunter Dennis Finch Hatton, another legendary womanizer, famous for his love affair with Karen Blixen. Blixen and Finch Hatton combined to become Safari's first generation of heartthrob hunters. The thing that comes across most about Braw Blixen for me is that he was a man's man that people wanted to befriend and to emulate and was also irresistible to women. So the best of both worlds. Lucky bastard. By the late 1930s, Safari was attracting hordes of wealthy European and American clients. But the promise of passion and romance under the African stars couldn't last forever. Back in Nairobi, affairs became widespread. In fact, one story revealed that jealousies could boil over with fatal consequences. In 1941, a high society murder scandalized the colony and became national news back home in Britain. Lord Joss Hay, the Earl of Errol, was murdered on the outskirts of Nairobi in a torrid story that would inspire the feature film, White Mischief. Now, we're going to go on a sort of murder mystery tour here of where these events took place. And what happened was this. Sir Jock Dells Broughton, who's about 55, married a great beauty called Diana Caldwell. And they'd been married for only two months, barely off the boat from Mombasa. And the Casanova of Kenya, also known as Lord Joss Hay, the Earl of Errol, who had bonked and bedded and cuckolded most of the husbands around here, fell mad in love with Diana. And this is where it really gets going. Lord Errol had a flagrant affair with Diana, and it soon became hot gossip on the terraces of the Mathega Club. But six weeks after the affair began, Errol was found dead in his car in the early hours of the morning on the 25th of January, 1941. He had been shot at point blank range. Jock Broughton was arrested on suspicion of murder but was found not guilty. However, unable to reconcile with Diana, he returned to England where two years later, he committed suicide by overdose. It remains an unsolved mystery, and it was this murder in the middle of the Second World War that brought notoriety and infamy to a very tiny minority of the aristocratic white settlers here in Kenya. The horrors of the Second World War erased all prospects of going on safari, and the once lucrative trade from Europe and America evaporated. Once the Allies were victorious, the colonists set about rebuilding their most famous industry, and the catalyst once again came from America. This time from the pen of the famous writer Ernest Hemingway. Hemingway went on safari in Kenya in 1934 and again in 1953. In a series of novels, he described safari with manly mastery, transforming the great white hunter into the role of hero. He described a world of glamour, danger and sex that was inevitably snapped up by Hollywood, and it was showtime. A stream of romantic movies followed glamorizing safari like Mogambo starring Clark Gable, Ava Gardner and Grace Kelly and King Solomon's Mines starring Stuart Granger and Deborah Carr. Hollywood portrayed white hunters as protectors, killers and womanizers, yet at one with nature. The women in the movies trembled at the hunter's machismo and were drawn irresistibly into their beds. The movies had huge appeal to audiences worldwide, prompting a tourist boom in pursuit of the Hollywood dream.
Hollywood undoubtedly reignited the allure of safari in the early 50s. Tourists flocked to Kenya, still known as British East Africa, in search of romance and adventure and trying to bag the big five. As the demand for hunting grew rapidly, so did the demand for a new generation of professional hunters to guide and protect people going through the dangerous bush. I'm now heading north to the foothills of Mount Kenya to meet one of the last professional hunters from that era, still alive to tell us his tale. Great white hunters are unusually guarded about recounting their hunting days, but we contacted Mike Pettijohn, a hunter from my father's generation who agreed to meet. Mike was considered one of the most fearless hunters of his era, but unbeknownst to anyone, his generation would be the last. Mike. Yeah. Richard. Nice to, to meet you. Come along in. Thank you very much. Mike, when did you become a professional hunter? I became actually a professional hunter in, in 1957, and uh, I was brought up amongst wildlife, and, and so I hunted ever since I was a boy of six, basically. And how close to death did you ever come? Um, what adventures did you come up against? I was thrown by a rhino once. I was knocked down by a buffalo and had a, the bullet shot through the buffalo. It went right the way through the buffalo, out of its neck. I had my feet round its neck and it knelt down and was pushing me along the ground. My gun bearer actually shot it through the backside and it went all the way through, out by the neck into the back of my leg. And I never realised I had so many holes. I didn't. Uh, I had a lot of problems with this leg because the, the bullet moved up, and a year later, a doctor took it out from up top here. You had a bullet so, in your bum, and you didn't know it was there. I didn't know it was there. I've heard of tough, but that's really <laughs> tough. God. <laughs> but one close call with death made Mike a legend in the hunting community when he was asked to help shoot a rogue lion that was killing local cattle. One of our pet bulls had been taken out, and so I went and I didn't have my own rifle with me then. I borrowed a rifle, and uh, it was old ammunition. And although it hit the lion pretty severely, it didn't kill it straight away. It was lying under a bush, and I could see its stomach was just going up and down, so I realized it was alive. And so I walked around trying to get a shot at it. Side and it obviously heard me coming and it suddenly just whipped out. I remember it coming towards me, its tail was going, driving it like the uh, propeller, like the propeller of an aeroplane. And uh, I put out my hand to stop it, and then it fell over, it came down on top of me, and I put my leg up and it grabbed my leg and its jaws. As Mike wrestled with a lion, his unarmed companion took a photograph, hoping that the flash would scare it away. He hadn't got a gun or anything, so the best defense was to take another picture. And the flash, obviously, I think the, the lion thought another bullet was coming, so it jumped off. And, uh, so flash photography saved your life? I would say the flash photography saved my life, yeah. When you describe this, it sounds as though it's so vivid. It sounds as though it could have happened yesterday. Yeah. And you're, how old are you now? 77. How old do you feel? 45. So does it, when you talk about this, does it seem as though it's very yeah, recent? Yeah, it does. I mean, it seems like yesterday, really. What I find personally extraordinary is that many of these elder statesmen of safari and hunting that I've met here are the age that my father, if he'd lived, uh, would have been because he'd be dead at 52. So there's um, great, I suppose, feeling of nostalgia for me of what I could have had. So, and that's a bit embarrassing, but I feel that loss in speaking to them. So it's almost like finding uh, proxy fathers along the journey. you get a sense of somebody who has lived in another era, although it's still, you're still in the present, but what they're talking about and their sensibility and their, 
their code of honour, if you like, is absolutely present in who they are now. It's only very nostalgic for me. George, you got me there. Bloody hell. The 50s and 60s, while full of adventure for professional hunters, marked the beginning of the end for hunting in Kenya. By now, the landscape had radically changed. The once open lands teeming with wildlife that early settlers had been tempted by were depleted and parceled up for development. The population was rapidly expanding. There were greater demands for farmland and hunting was spiraling out of control. The growing African population, who had little option for buying land for farming, were forced to turn to poaching from private land and national parks, either for food or for ivory to sell. As a result, they killed vast numbers of animals indiscriminately. Meanwhile, conflicts over land rights resulted in the Mau Mau uprising, as the colonialists and Kenyans were locked in fierce battles, resulting in 100 settlers and 10,000 Africans being killed. The war culminated in the end of British rule, and on the 1st of June 1963, Kenya was declared independent. This is one of the happiest days of my life. But the new African government failed to get a grip on poaching, and the situation escalated. Peter Mwenge was a poacher in that era. Decades later, he is a gamekeeper and patrols the Aberdare forest to conserve the animal population. Peter, this is enormous. What's this? What animal is this for? Uh, this is for, for trapping buffalo. If the animal comes across to put in inside like that, yeah. it, it, it is caught like that. So this is guaranteed to kill the animal? Yeah. Ah! <laughs> Peter, can you explain what this yeah. monster is? Those are bad elephant traps. They are put down and covered by soil that mm -hmm. the elephant cannot see in it. When it is starting to move there, it is, it is inside their legs. So it's injured? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Poof, inside the hair. And after moving maybe two to three days, it is defeated how to move. Start lying, no food, it's dead. So then poachers can come and get it? Tusks. Tusks. Yeah. Peter, when you were a poacher, yeah. what weapons did you use? Well, when I was a poacher, I was using spears and spare it. And would it die instantly? There and there. Pew. What? Through the neck? No, no. Through oh. the, the heart. I did a very bad work, unknowingly. So when did that change, when you became a conservationist? Um, it came, that, that time there were professional people, professional hunters. Mm -hmm. They came to my place. They asked someone who could show them the bush to hunt. Mm -hmm. So I was, uh, I was appointed to take them up by somebody. When I took them in the forest, I, and, uh, I was given five shillings per day, five shillings per one day. And we killed one bongo on license, professional licensing. Uh -huh. uh, I realized those animals can give you money. I started to live slowly by slowly to stop that work of poaching. While Peter Mwenge and Mike Pettijohn were once hunters in the same era, but from separate cultures, today they work together for the conservation of the Aberdare forests. But their relationship is a minority in the history of safari. By the late 1960s, poaching had continued to rise and national parks like Tsavo lost 35,000 elephants and 5,000 rhinoceros. As the wildlife population continued to plummet across Kenya, a growing conservation movement was making any form of hunting ever more unacceptable. Finally, the Kenyan government 
decided to impose a ban on all forms of hunting in 1977 in an attempt to conserve the wildlife that remained. Despite the ban, safari continued to expand, reinventing itself along the way. Cheap air travel meant ever more tourists could fly into Nairobi for the safari experience, with the gun being replaced by the camera. By the 70s and 80s, photo safaris became a mass market. But the history of safari proves that there are always people willing to pay to shoot wild animals, and safari hunters spread to Tanzania, Somalia, Uganda, Botswana, and South Africa, where it is still legal. Morning. North of Johannesburg in South Africa is the Melarani Ranch, owned by Stuart Dorrington. Stuart's hunting operation allows him to plough the profits he makes from clients back into breeding new stock. He agreed to let me follow a hunt with his friend Peter Flack. Stuart and Peter are hoping to find an older animal, past breeding age, that would either die of natural causes soon or be culled. Looking for an impala or a wildebeest, so then you just want to make sure that it's not a young animal that's still going to be breeding, it's an older bull, and that it's still a nice animal if you want to put him on the wall. Sometimes you'll see exactly what you're looking for, and then you'll drive past out of earshot and, um, and out of sight, and then put in a stalk. Should I walk in single file? Yeah, I think walk in single file. If you can walk behind Peter. So behind Peter, okay. After only 10 minutes of tracking, Stuart thinks he has spotted the perfect animal. It's a full beast, yeah. Yeah. And quick, that, that, was, that, was, that was quick. Whew, that was a lovely bull. Yeah, that was a nice bull. Yeah. I just went behind his leg. Yeah, I could see the blood, yeah. uh, the lung blood, so he, he obviously hit a, went right through the vitals. You can still hear him going round. He's down. Yeah. It's just the nerves kicking. There he is. What is the tin? This is, yeah. Oh. So what is that movement now? Nerves? That's or? nerves. Just yeah. pure nerves. That's what I thought it was going on down there. You know, sometimes with the last thick. Well, that amazed me that he's still going. I thought he did. How tough things he's full of yest. It's the toughest animal pound for pound, I think, on the African continent. If they were as big as buffaloes, people would hunt them in armoured cars. Peter's adrenaline was clearly pumping, and it reminds me of tracking with Gordy Church and how emotionally charged I felt back then. Taking him off has no impact on the population, really, because he's not a breeding bull. What happens next? Well, we normally clean him up. We take a couple of photos. Stuart prices the animals he offers for hunting according to their breed. Shooting the wildebeest cost 825 US dollars, while the most expensive animal he offers is the sable antelope, costing 9,750 US dollars. Safari hunting in South Africa is booming, with clients like Peter ready to pay for the privilege. Although it sounds like a huge contradiction, Stuart is convinced that paid hunting can play a vital role in helping the animal population grow, and there's no doubt he loves both his land and the wildlife that roams it. 
can I ask you about this farm here, or yes. ranch, is where your mother and her father lived. Yes. And it's now been converted from a traditional farm yes. back to the land as it would have been before anybody farmed here. That's right, yes. And that's because the value of game supersedes livestock. Yeah, exactly. You can... Um, the, the, the economics basically dictates the land use at the end of the day and um, I have no problem with that with game because I, I love wildlife and it's always been my dream to turn this into a, a reserve uh, and a domain for wild animals. From the hunting we managed to invest the proceeds into rare species so not only have we brought back the species that used to be fairly common here, we've brought back species like the white rhino and the sable antelope and it's causing this huge population explosion. So Stuart, are you saying that it, it, it sounds like a contradiction in terms that you have hunting, but because it's controlled and licensed, uh, that increases the amount of game that there is. Absolutely. It, 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 it's uh, totally true that way. You know? And it incentivizes when you are then looking after your own game, you're not going to kill the goose that lays the golden egg. You want to have another goose. You know? So you, you look after your game better than probably many of the national parks are being looked after because you want them to be fruitful and multiply. When Stuart took over Malarani 26 years ago, the wildlife on his land consisted of only a handful of kudu and warthog. But today he has over two and a half thousand head of game. Even though hunting safaris are in the minority in Africa, Stuart's operation has shown me that hunting might still have an important role to play in conservation. But what about Kenya, the historical home of safari, where the hunting ban still remains? Last night, we had a four-hour higgledy-piggledy drive down a track that I've never been anything like in my life, from the foothills of Mount Kenya to this camp in Gwazi, and I've just woken up now at Lazarus. This is the Garden of Eden. Spectacular. Hunting or not, safari has always been about the sheer power and glory of the African landscape. This is Ilinguezi, and I hope that lodges like this signal the future of safari in Africa. Ilinguezi is run by the local Maasai community. The idea for the lodge came from local white settlers, who helped generate the funding to build it. But the Maasai have been involved from the start, and were responsible for the lodge's unique eco-friendly construction. The current lodge manager is Ocean Sakita Maini. So it's the first Maasai run this is the first owned safari in, in Kenya? Yeah, indeed. This is the first Maasai owned and managed safari here in Kenya. And when the first guests arrived here, was that a shock when people actually arrived? Oh, well, I tell you it was a shock because um, we did not understand how to handle and it was the first time we were seeing tourists. So for us at that time it was even uh, difficult because these were different people. Mm -hmm. uh, the color, the pink color, it was difficult for us even to shake hands. These people were telling we wanted them to keep their distance. So you're saying that when you first met the pink people, yeah. um, and you had to keep them at a distance. Keep them at a distance, w yeah. Was it, how long did it take to, to learn or adopt a Western style of business to run the safari camp? It, it took us quite some time and um, more than one year to slowly understand. And are you making money? Yeah, we're making money now. And what happens to it? And this one, suppose the way down, uh, the, the revenue we generate from this one is again plowed back in the community uh, to, to support the various uh, projects and programs we have in the community. These are water, education, that is schools and bursaries for the school going children. Um, it goes to, to assist in conserving um, the ecosystem. Um, yeah. 
Ilinguezi has been the inspiration behind 10 other African-run safari lodges that have been set up across Kenya over the past decade. While still in the minority, Ilinguezi feels like the way forward to experience a truly integrated African safari, free of any colonial echoes. It's 6.30 in the morning here on Mara and we're about to go up on a balloon ride. I have no idea where, which direction we're going in, what the wind will be like or where we're going to land. My journey through safari was coming to an end and it would finish in a truly magical way. For all the bloodshed and colonial exploitation, I have discovered the emotional heart of Africa still beats on. I'm back in the Masai Mara, this time with guide Toby Fenwick Wilson. Toby represents the new breed of British settlers who cater for the super wealthy on safari in Kenya once again. And he's taking me on the trip of a lifetime. Now for me, this is the elemental Africa. Wildlife below us and unspot wilderness. This is a perfect, perfect time because the night shift is essentially changing the day shift. So these are first little grumbles of activity. Anything that I say, any words are going to be chicken pellets compared to what you see here. You can't, no word can take in what this is. Look, there's a, there's a leopard. Oh my God. There's a leopard. There's a leopard going through. God, I've never seen that. That's... Hippos down there. They literally have just come back. They'll, they'll, they'll have been out grazing and they've just potted back in. Oh, we're going right That's over really. it. Right over it. That instant adrenaline sort of that you get. Like a five-year-old. This is the closest I ever get to feeling like a bird or Sinbad on a magic carpet ride. It's a wild dog. No, no, no hyena. No, no, hyena. Hyena. Floating over the Mara conjures up the hypnotic spirit of freedom those early settlers must have experienced over a century ago. Leopard, elephant, giraffe, baby giraffe, baby hippo, gobsmacked human. Jumbo. Jumbo, son. After recovering from a breathtaking flight, Toby treats me to a champagne breakfast in the bush. There we go. Whoops. Toby's clients are the top end of safari today. The biggest kick for me was seeing that leopard. They come from all around the world and include film stars, IT moguls and bigwigs from Wall Street, who all crave the freedom of safari. And a lot of these people are cash rich, time poor. And they're coming out here to actually have a bit of space. Slough off that sort of chaos of the lives that they're of the busy lives they're leading. I mean, you get these great mandarins that are coming in from Wall Street, wherever it is. One, they're out of their comfort zone and they're in the hands of some lunatic guide, you know, which is already they're slightly on the back foot. That would be slightly nervous. But you can see them, they're, they're, they're slightly twitching. Where's my telephone and all that stuff? And by day two or three, the nervousness is gone. The, the twitching is gone. The blackberries are out. The face is relaxed. Ten years younger. And what I'm, my whole ambition in a safari is to get someone in this context and have the ability to think, repolarize, um, enjoy the animals. You're trying to allow them into your head and give them an opportunity to see why you're so passionate 
about this lifestyle. And that is what I'm trying to tune people into. You understand that it's in your blood, it's in my blood. But if, if I can in some way instill even a percentage of that unknown inner feeling, then I've done a good job and I'm happy. After a journey through the history of safari, I wasn't ready to leave Kenya yet. I still had one last animal I wanted to see. Lion are the royalty of the African plains, and Toby heard on the Bush Telegraph that a pride had been spotted on a nearby hillside. Seeing them close up would complete my own personal Big Five. Yeah, yeah, there, 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 there they are. Yeah. Directly yeah, ahead. You're in, you're in, Do you see, in. sitting on the... Yeah. Looks like three of them. But I may be Good eyes. completely wrong. They are there, aren't they? Old Swazi boy eyes. <laughs> oh my God. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. There are seven here. Oh, youngster, look. I'm just thinking, Richard, it's one thing seeing lions. But in this geographic context, it just couldn't be more perfect, could it? Couldn't. It's sublime. Like generations of settlers before him, there is no doubting Toby's genuine love for Africa and its wildlife. And I know that once it's in your blood, it never lets you go. <laughs> oh, there's another. Eight altogether. Yes, on the move. Safari is still a story of white settlers in Kenya, but the search for freedom that inspired so many to come here in the first place is what attracts over a million tourists to visit every year. I hope it's a freedom that carries on inspiring and feeding the human soul into the future. <laughs>